Hi everyone, this is Sister Agnes Therese, and I want to wish you a glorious and blessed Easter, but I also want to acknowledge that this is not a normal Easter. In fact, I think the image the Lord's been giving me is that this is an Easter we're going to spend together in the desert. We know that the Christian celebration of Easter is a communal act of remembrance and celebration of God's saving deeds. So as heirs of the promises God made to his chosen people Israel, we remember the ancient Passover accomplished in Egypt when God's angel passed over those houses marked by the blood of the sacrificial lambs, sparing the firstborns from death. But even more than that, we remember Christ's definitive Passover from the grave to the heart of the Father, the source of all life worked by his perfect self-immolation on the cross. The blood of the sacrificial lamb is given as our true drink in the Eucharistic feast and marks our lips, the doorposts of the temples we are, saving us too from the grave. That's awesome. But how can we rejoice when we can't be together? How can we partake of Paschal joy when most of us can't be present at the Paschal banquet? How can we lift up our hearts to the one lifted on the cross when we can't be present at the Mass where that sacrifice is once more made present? What do we do? It seems to me that we're being called to spend this Easter the same way that the Israelites spent the time immediately after the Passover, which is to say we're being called to spend it in the desert. This isn't the desert of temptation where we joined Jesus in Lent. I think it's a different desert. In that desert, the Son of Man entered radically into our poverty, suffering hunger and thirst, doing battle alone against the Prince of Darkness. We too have fasted and prayed this Lent. We've each striven to be conformed more and more to the likeness of Jesus. But now we enter the Easter desert, not as solitary individuals, but as a church, the people of God. And in this Easter desert, we, like the Israelites traveling to the promised land, can be transformed from individuals concerned only with our own survival in a strange land into the body of Christ, one with each other, totally depending on our head for everything. Those 40 years the Israelites spent in the desert were years spent learning three things, care for one another, obedience, and filial dependence on God. Having been reduced to slavery in Egypt, which is a state where everybody has to fend for themselves, right, when you're a slave, and trust is not usually achievable. Consider the way that Moses had to break up a fight between two Hebrews in Egypt. Um, God's people needed to learn, after leaving that place, how to be family to one another, how to call one another on in holiness of life. They're not individuals alone now. They're the people of God. And they and we rise and fall together. We see this early in the sojourn in the desert because Moses, of course, went up to receive the law on Mount Sinai. And while Moses prayed and listened, the people became restive, built a golden calf to worship, gorged themselves and capped off the whole experience with an orgy. Great. This, although they had been liberated from Egypt for one reason, as Moses said to Pharaoh, to offer sacrifice to the Lord in the desert. But they were bored. They were removed from their routine, and they were taken away from the rituals of worship they'd known. And so they began worshiping the work of their hands and the calf, the goods of the earth in food and drink, and pleasure and comfort in the orgy. And so in doing this, they re-enter the slavish lifestyle of Egypt and forgot the purpose for which they'd been freed. Moses, of course, is sent down from God to bring them back to their right mind. And he loves the people enough to call them onto holiness. And this is beautiful because it's not just an isolated moment. Like Moses has this, you know, feeling of benevolence this one time. No, like over and over and over again, he, um, he continues to love the people in their infidelity. And in fact, God, of course, offers to make a new people out of Moses' own seed. And Moses says, no, he's with the people to the very end. And in this, he learns the feel and the taste and the shape of real love, a love that is self-sacrificial and a love that calls the beloved to be the best they can be. I'm sure that the same can be said of everybody who made it to the promised land. Everybody who made it to the Jordan, I'm sure, learned that same self-sacrificial love, that love that calls the beloved to be the best. 
And I wonder how we're being called to grow in that love, in that care for one another, with our families and with the family of the church in this season. Do I turn a blind eye, maybe as my spouse becomes completely absorbed in building a golden calf through his or her work? Maybe they're home with me, but not present. Maybe I'm medicating my boredom or anxiety with food and drink, Instagram, and endless videos, like this video. <laughs> Maybe my family is desperately trying to glean any pleasure or comfort we can, while we can, fearful that we don't have many days left of enjoyment. Are we ready to be as radically faithful to one another and to the people we're stuck with in isolation as Moses was to his people in the desert? The second lesson of the desert after care for one another is obedience. And a casual reading of Numbers yields bountiful evidence of discord between God's people and Moses, their human shepherd, God's proxy. Several times there were revolts against his leadership, and at one point even his own flesh and blood, Aaron and Miriam, are jealous of him and undermine his God-given authority. And I bet that when the manna first appeared and Moses announced the regulations um, concerning it, namely that people were only supposed to gather what they needed for that day, um, there were probably tons of people who woke up the next morning to rotten manna in their tents. And we know there were at least some because it says so. They would not listen to Moses when some kept a part of the manna over until the following morning, it became wormy and rotten. Therefore, Moses was displeased with them. And this isn't really surprising, right? Because it's very normal to try to hedge our bets when we have less than perfect trust in our leaders, even those appointed by God directly, like Moses, or maybe those appointed by the church, like our bishops. So maybe we hold back a little manna, or maybe we start talking to others in the community about how we would be a better Moses and we would make better choices. But here in the desert, we're called to learn trust in spite of everything. It was, in fact, lack of obedience that caused the extreme length of the sojourn in the desert, right? The people made it to the banks of the, the promised land, sent scouts out, and became terrified and refused to go forward and claim their inheritance. This can happen to us, too. One of my favorite biblical passages comes from Acts, when God himself says to Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the goad. A goad is a start, sharp stick used for herding cattle, and when a, with a docile animal, just like the pressure of the stick is enough to move them in the right direction. Um, but a disobedient ox or cow kicks against the sharp stick, and thereby hurting itself, even to the point of shedding blood. How often have I turned sharp, uh, slight pressure in my life into bleeding pain because I've kicked against the goad? I know that this is in the case in community sometimes, right? I get asked to help to do something, or which is more common for me, told I can't do something that I think is a great idea. And instead of accepting the gentle pressure of the Lord through my superiors, I push against that and I work myself into a fine state of discontent. But were I to trust and obey, as the old hymn says, I'd be happier, more whole, better off. And of course, this doesn't mean that we just never ask questions or blindly follow whatever anybody says if there are like real problems or abuses in leadership. That's not what I'm saying. But rather, it means that in the ordinary course of life, after I, a fallible sinner, have considerately shared what light I have with those other fallible sinners who happen to be in leadership, I trust that God will turn even mistakes and suboptimal decisions for my good and our good. And I obey the irresistible call to the cross that such circumstances proffer. And the last lesson of the Easter deserts, besides love for one another and obedience, is filial dependence on God. Because at the end of the day, it isn't Moses whom the people distrust. And it's not finally Moses to whom their loyalty is owed. It's God himself whom they did not trust. And it's God himself whom we do not trust. This is original sin. As the catechism says, man tempted by the devil, let his trust in his creator die in his heart and abusing his freedom, disobeyed God's command. All subsequent sin would be disobedience toward God and lack of trust in his goodness. God knows this wound of distrust that festers in, a, in us and he states it clearly to Samuel, another harried leader of the Old Testament in a later incident in the annals of disobedience of Israel's history. God says, it is not you they reject. 
they are rejecting me. So we come to this essential, most important lesson of the desert, trust and reliance on God. Will he give us food? Will he give us water? Does he know that our human limitations mean that we, don't, we won't do well with a manna-only diet? Is there something else he can give us? How can we have what we need? How will our children have what they need? in the desert. I think a lot of us are asking these questions as we get ready for an Easter in isolation, an Easter without the consolation of the sacraments. What is Easter without receiving the Eucharist? What is Easter without being with family, without smelling the incense and hearing the bells and feeling the resounding alleluias? What is Easter when I've lost a loved one or am working in a COVID unit? What's Easter when my grandma's in a nursing home and I know that could be the next place hit? What's Easter when I can't serve people the way I love to? When my hands are tied by the needs of my community and the importance of self-quarantine and the knowledge that I live with vulnerable people? It's Easter. Without being at Mass, without the normal, beautiful, good supports of liturgy and the broader community and festivity, we can still celebrate the awesome triumph of God who entered into our death and destroyed it. A triumph which is still being sung right now in this beautiful springtime by the very earth here as daffodils bloom and fruit trees blossom, grass greens the mud and pe peony stalks push through mulch. Though many cannot receive Eucharist, still we have the awesome privilege of living Eucharistic lives offering the stuff of our lives, even maybe our fear or disappointment, on the altars of the world where the Mass is still being offered. We have the privilege of allowing God to transform that stuff of our life into himself and feed his family with the bread that we are. Even deserts bloom. One of the surprising joys I had in a pilgrimage to the Holy Land was discovering wildflowers peeking up all over the place through cracks in the street and dust on the side of mountains. It was so strange. And I wonder what flowers are blooming in your Easter desert. Is a new appreciation for your family growing? Have you been able to see an area of your life where you need to make a change? Are you more grateful for things you once took for granted, like fresh produce or communications technology, toilet paper? Has God surprised you by the way he is present to you in the temple that you are, even when you can't be in the church? Maybe you have a new sense of his indwelling, begun at baptism, strengthened every day by your love, often forgotten. Now's a good time, too, to remember that God himself is not bound by his sacraments, as the Catechism says. Isn't that amazing? That means that we can still have true communion with God and with one another, even when we can't receive the Eucharist. And as always, those dying can be perfectly reconciled to God, even when they can't receive the sacraments. Grace is still flowing more readily than water from the rock in the desert. It's just that the customary channels of grace have been for a time diverted. But it flows nonetheless. So let us cooperate with the work of this Easter desert, this desert of growth, of community, and of trust. Stuck with one another, let's learn to love one another. Without recourse to the sacraments, let's cling to God himself, whose grace overflows the banks of those streams of grace. Let's live this season in such a way that God himself can echo to us the words Elizabeth spoke to Mary at the visitation, blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. How will the Lord find us this Easter morning as he rises to meet us? Will we recognize him or will tears cloud our vision as they did Mary Magdalene's? Will we hear others' words of joy and hope and feel like Thomas left outside? Or will we courageously follow John into the very darkness of the tomb and seeing its emptiness, believe. My prayers and our prayers are with you in this extraordinary time and in an especially intense way in this holiest time of the year. 
I carry you with me in our liturgies, and I hope that through our celebration of the Easter mysteries here, Jesus will communicate himself in all his radiant love and glory to you. I hope that you'll know his utter trustworthiness. And I hope that you will rejoice, even in the desert. One of my favorite songs of my youth ends with, uh, it's a very uh, Lenten song, but it ends on an Easter note. So let's, I'll make that my prayer for you as we close. Early hasten to the tomb where they lay his breathless clay. All is solitude and gloom who has taken him away. Christ is risen, he meets our eyes. Savior, teach us so to rise. God bless you. Happy Easter.